All right, thank you. Um, so my talk today is about Tada maps, of course, uh, specifically web maps. I want to first ask, did anybody create any maps so far, like web maps or any kind of maps? All right, we've got like five hands. So uh, this is perfect because this is actually an introductory to, to web mapping, and I'll be talking more about the mapping part than the web part. So um, first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Raluca, and contrary to popular belief in other countries, this is actually my first name. It's a typical Romanian name. Um, I studied cartography, and I really like the web, so I'm one of those people who kind of like self-taught uh, themselves um, all the web magic. And as a result, I work on web mapping tools at a company called Esri. Uh, we do a lot of geospatial software, but um, uh, so we have like mobile and desktop and uh, web applications. I personally work on the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, which is an API that allows you to visualize uh, 3D data on the web. And here are some examples. You can check them um, also at my website. But I'm also going to show you some of them live. So uh, this is a project I worked on with a colleague, the Globe of Extremes, I called it. It's um, basically showing points on a 3D globe. He made this really nice uh, base map and I created the application. Uh, so for example, you can see like the highest uh, point on Earth's surface and it's kind of like inviting you to explore it because it has this, this playful look. And then the app that actually got me here, as Diana said, is this, um, so when you look at it first, you think, oh, it's a nice sketch, somebody drew it really nicely. But then you start interacting with it and you realize, oh, this is actually an interactive 3D application. And this is done with our API, like we have a sketch mode that you can turn on and tune some parameters and then it looks like, like hand-drawn. It was a bit of like kind of a fun creative project in the company. And there's, if you want to uh, see more examples, you can go to the website or uh, go to my website. <laughs> All right, so now that you know who I am, uh, this, this talk here is really based on the workflow that I have when I create web maps. So I always start with the story that I want to tell. And then I move on to searching for data. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of data out there, um, you know, also geodata. Uh, the, only, the problem is to actually interpret it. We don't, we're not lacking data today anymore. And then once I find the data, then I go and, and visualize it on a map. And for this talk, I actually picked the topic and I'm going to go through um, all the steps. I mean, not all the steps, because it took me 20 hours to make that map, so we're definitely not gonna go through all the steps, but like the main steps to actually create that map. So the story, stories are like everywhere. And on this slide, I have just a few topics uh, that you might um, find interesting and would like to tell stories about. Uh, election results is the topic that I picked for this presentation. Uh, evolution of global temperature, city development plans, unemployment rates, they all kind of like have this, um, this side where if you wanna tell a story, maps help you so much better to tell it. Like they're much more um, intuitive and better to understand than an Excel sheet, for example. So our story for today will be the European Parliament election in Romania, May 2019. And, <laughs> and um, I, I actually looked in the media, like the Romanian online media, and these, these maps that I'm showing here are uh, what you can actually find. So basically, they map the predominant party on the counties, and you get, the, uh, most of them are not interactive, or interactive, so Hot News was like the only one that actually had an interactive map. And uh, as you can see, like for me, when I look at these maps, I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's like interesting, like you can read some, some insights there, but um, I would like to see more detail. I would like to see are there differences maybe between cities and rural areas. Um, I would like to see maybe in that big county over there, there are like smaller regions that voted maybe for a different party. And the map that I made to show this is this one over here. So I mapped everything at, um, whoop, sorry, um, at what we call administrative unit level. So it's much more detailed. And um, each party is represented by a color and then you can, um, you can filter it to see uh, which party is 
has been like where people voted uh, with whom. And then on this map, you can actually see like the blue party is the one that was voted mostly in the cities. So it's a party like it's an alliance that was formed now more recently and people kind of like in the cities had more hopes and thought, okay, I'm going to vote for them. Um, then you can see like the red party um, <laughs> is, <laughs> is like more in the south um, and also in Moldavia. Um, you can see here this green party. So opacity on this map represents uh, the more opaque it is, the more percentage that party had. So for example, the, 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 here is where the Hungarian minorities live and a little bit here. And you can see how uh, they actually, when they vote, they, it's like 92% of them voted for the Hungarian party. So they're really decided. Um, in in, in um, contrast to like, for example, in Timisoara where we are, people voted for, um, for USR, for the blue party, but um, it's only like 40%. And then another thing that I wanted to show you, maybe in this view it's better. Uh, so you can see here the mountain chain and you can kind of like see how it creates like a bit of, um, how to say like a border, like a natural border. And people, for example, here in Sibiu, they vote more for Penele for the, for the yellow party. So there's like a lot of insights that you can draw from a more detailed map. And I'm going to show you how I made it. So uh, let's start with the data. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with geographic coordinates, so a little bit of flashback to fourth grade geography. Um, so when I talk about data, I actually mean geodata, uh, which is like data with location information. And every point on Earth can be described by two coordinates, latitude and longitude. Um, latitude are the parallels uh, that go south and north. And for example, this point P here in the image um, is uh, 60 degrees latitude north. And then longitude are the meridians that go from, from um, uh, that go east and west. They actually go from, from like the uh, circles, of go from north to south, so to say. And um, you have meridian zero in Greenwich, and then our point P here would be 80 degrees longitude east. So um, with this knowledge in our bags, <laughs> we can move on to like types of data. Uh, there are many types of data, but I'm going to only talk about the ones that I actually used for my app, because otherwise we'd be here for hours. So um, first of all, raster data. Raster data is, for example, satellite imagery, um, or in the image that I have um, below, it uh, could be, for example, water temperature. And in each case, pixels can then store either RGB values or uh, temperature values. Uh, there are many ways to serve it on the web, but the one that I use, which is also like quite popular, is to split them into tiles so that you can, you can load only the, the tiles that are interesting for your region. And these tiles are pre-generated. You store them then on the server in this folder-based structure. Um, they are also growing exponentially as you zoom in. So for example, zoom level zero would have one tile but then zoom level one has four tiles and then uh, zoom level two would have four to the power of two, so 16 tiles. Uh, there are a total of 20 zoom levels, so you can imagine lots of tiles in there. Um, when you request them, you have this uh, schema that it's like standard. Uh, you, it's the first like the URL where you actually store those tiles and then the zoom level and then the coordinates of the tile in the tile schema. And I use this for my hill shading. So to actually be able to see the mountains, um, there's this technique in cartography where you create like a, a hill shade. And lucky me, actually, I didn't have to create it because um, SOS provides world services for different various data sets and hill, terrain hill shade is one of them. So I, in my application, I actually loaded a terrain hill shade. And now I'm gonna switch a bit to the code just to show you um, what this actually means. It's a few lines of code. Uh, generally in GIS you have a map, that's like a basic concept, and then you add layers to it. And that's what I did here. So I'm loading this hill shade um, service as a layer, and basically for each type of layer you have a class. And um, uh, the world hill shade, this is like the service that Esri provides. And I just loaded that in because otherwise it, it's really it's an art to make a nice hill shade, and um, Esri provides all the services, so why not just use them? 
And then I, I just loaded it. I loaded this heel shade layer by passing in, in the base map layers of my map. And now if I go to the application, I just uh, want to show you. Go to plus. That's not, oh, sorry. All right, I'm going to reload. And now if I filter here by hill shade, shade layer. Sometimes already kicked in. Um, then you can see, for example, like this one. Uh, this is how we make the request. So you have like the zoom level, X and Y. And then this is, for example, one tile. So we kind of like make this map from these tiles. All right. Next up for the data, uh, we have obviously vector data. Um, so I think all of you kind of know this. So vector data is basically just like vertices and Polygon is an array of vertices where the first vertex is the last vertex, uh, lines or also, and then for points, you basically just have one vertex. And how we describe them is, if you look, that's a bus station over there, so it can have some properties where it tells you what it is. And um, you have to have the geometry, which are more than uh, just an array of numbers, so like the latitude and longitude. If you want to load this kind of data on the web, again, there are many types of services, but I'm just going to talk about um, the vector tile service because this is something I used in my app. Um, the concept is similar to the raster tiles, just that this time you don't tile uh, images, you tile vectors. Uh, the format, again, is different. It could be either GeoJSON or protobuffer. Protobuffer is more common because um, it's more compact and it, it's faster to download. Uh, we usually use it for large data sets, so in this case it's like Imagine base maps where you have like buildings and roads and all kinds of all kinds of data. And the request schema is pretty similar. The cool part about vector tiles though is that you can style them just by passing in a JSON file with the styles. And you can't do that with raster tiles. With raster tiles, if you want to change the width of the street, you would have to recook the whole data set. But here you would just need to change one line or two lines in the in the JSON file. And based on the JSON, you can get like very different maps, like the ones that um, I show in this slide. So you could have like a dark uh, themed base map, or you could have like a, a funny base map with some funny fonts. You can change the fonts. You can have links to glyphs to, to make like patterns on your base map and so on. And what I actually used it for is not so exciting. I needed the borders and I needed also the water bodies. So then I, I used again a vector tile service that Esri provides. And I'll show you that one in a bit. Yeah, this one I don't have right now. So here, for example, oh, first let me show you how you style them. So um, there are a lot of, uh, I mean a lot of, there are a few uh, uh, web applications that allow you to load these, these uh, services and then you can style them directly. So for example, this is the base map that I used. And if I would want to style the border over here, um, I could just go here and like change the color. It's just as easy as that. Uh, but as you can see, there are like many layers and uh, sub layers and sub layers of sub layers. So the structure is quite complex um, over here. And then once I'm happy with it, I'm, I could just go ahead and download the current style, which is just a JSON. And I already have that over here. So if you want to have a look, this is what it looks like. Um, references to fonts and glyphs and so on, and then you have the styles for each layer. And the way I used it in my map was, uh, where is it? So, country borders. This one over here. I just said, oh, I want a new vector tile layer, and then you can, um, I passed in the URL to the vector tile service. Again, Esri has one for the whole world. And then I loaded the style from like my JSON, and uh, afterwards I just passed it in the map just the way I did it with the hill shade. And that's how this one works. Now these th these uh, types of services are used for really large data sets, but if you have like smallish ones, so like a few megabytes, you don't need to um, to to go through the uh, publishing vector tile services and so on. Um, you could just load it as a GeoJSON or as a CSV. 
Um, so GeoJSON is basically a JSON with geo information. It has a stricter schema. Uh, you have to have a geometry property and mention the type of that feature. You could use it for points, lines, and polygons. And CSV is much more compact. Uh, for example, in here I have the same, uh, uh, like one point, one earthquake, and you can see GeoJSON is much more readable, but CSV um, is much more compact. So how did I use that? Well, I needed administrative units. As you could see, my map was uh, very detailed. So it's basically 3,180 something administrative units. And um, as a GeoJSON, if you download it, it's like 200 megabytes. So we're not gonna load that in an application. Um, the, what I wanted to do was, I think you saw that I used points. I did not use the borders. So when I converted it to points and converted it to a CSV, it was actually 345 kilobytes. So that's basically what I'm loading in my application. And um, I'll also talk to you about processing data now and then I'll show you the demo. Um, the thing is, when you download all this data, so I found my data on a site called geospatial.org, which is like a, a Romanian community maintained uh, site. And um, the election data, I found it on the official website for election results. So you will find all these data sets, but you will rarely find them in the format that you need. So you will need to like process it. And processing could involve converting between data formats or reprojecting the data from one projection to another, cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, the tools I use are pretty much uh, Esri biased, <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of like also open source tools out there for you to do all this. Um, uh, this is what I actually mostly used for the project that I, I did today. And um, just a small overview of all the steps, because I told you, I think this part actually takes the longest. Like you would think, oh, the visualization must take a long time, but actually it's like 10 hours of fighting and codings and, and all these things. And then it's like uh, 10 minutes of like styling it in the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. So um, how it worked was I downloaded the polygon data, converted it to points, I, I added latitude, longitude coordinates, saved it as a CSV file, and uh, the election results and the polygon data had this common name field that sometimes matched and sometimes didn't. <laughs> so I did this uh, merge based on the name and then I needed to calculate new fields to figure out what was the predominant party, what was the percentage, how many votes did they actually have, and I saved it as a CSV. And the result is this one over here. So I hope you can see. Um, here are like all the uh, parties encoded, G1 to G16, the name of the municipality of the administrative unit, the county it belongs to, and this is the magic geo ingredient, <laughs> the two coordinates. And then these three fields over here, uh, predominant party, the percentage, and absolute are like what I calculated afterwards. And what do we do with this file? We just load it as a CSV layer. <laughs> so this is common like for all the mapping APIs. Here I'm showing um, our API, the uh, uh, RGS API for JavaScript, but most of the times mapping APIs have this kind of like um, different types of layers, and all you have to do is to pass in the source to your data, and you'll get it on the map. All right. So um, let's talk a bit about the fun part, which is the visualization. Um, an important thing that I wanted to mention, I mean, it's important for us cartographers, <laughs> Uh, is that, uh, that we distinguish between location or reference maps that tell you, hey, you are here, and you have it, you, they're pretty detailed, um, just to like, so you can get a lot of information from it about where you are and what's around you. But what I want to talk about today are thematic maps. And these are the maps that take like a topic, and you can visualize it in an abstract way so that you can like derive more insights from it. And these topics are very, they relate back to the stories I told you before. Um, very different topics, population density, uh, crime location, ocean salinity, you name it. And then when, when we think about thematic maps, there are many types. I will only talk about two that are relevant for this map. Uh, this is the kind of map that you can see a lot in, in, in the media and in the newspapers. Um, we, call, we call it, we gave it a funny name, we call it a choropleth map. But um, the idea is 
always the same. Basically, you have areas, and you want to map an indicator on those areas and see where do you have more or less of that. And this, for example, here is a map of the population density by counting the U.S. Um, the map that I showed you of the elections in the media is also this type of map. And then the map I converted it to is a proportional symbols map where basically every feature is like the symbol of the feature is scaled by some indicator. So in, in this map, you can see a globe of the earthquakes and each earthquake has, is represented by a circle that is scaled by uh, the magnitude. So there are many other types of thematic maps. I'm not gonna go into that. One thing they all have in common, they have like this thematic data and a base map. And when it comes to the base map, you should kind of keep in mind that it's there only to provide context and uh, you should not like kind of abuse it, so to say. So try to, to, to keep it minimal and simple and try to make the visual emphasis should be on the thematic data. So some more tips and tricks about thematic maps too. These are kind of like rules that are base rules that I think it's important that everybody who makes a map knows, even if they're not like professional cartographers or so. Um, when your data progresses from low to high, you should use a sequential color scheme, which basically means uh, you should pick a hue and then it goes from light to dark because instinctively people associate darker areas with like higher values. So this will already like help you um, to tell your story faster, so to say, because of this uh, convention. Then if we have um, a map where your data, it, you could split it in like categories that don't have like this order thing, then uh, you should use different colors and you should not play with the saturation or the lightness because saturation and lightness, as I showed you before, kind of tell, oh, this is more important than that or higher than that. So here you should, um, in my, election map, I just use different colors. Now when we look at this map, this is the thing I told you before. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me it's more like um, I want to see more details. I want to see insights. And if you have large administrative areas, it's hard to say. They might also encompass a smaller area where actually the trend is totally different. So to help you see those trends, it's really nice. And if it's possible, if you have the data, of course, if you would use smaller administrative uh, units. And now when I look at this map and I show you the charts with the final results, and I tell you, hey, actually the blue party has the same number of votes as the red party, you'd be like, what? The red party is like everywhere <laughs> and the blue is only in those small points. And the problem with choropleth maps is that they are very area biased. So um, the people will kind of interpret the information based on how much they see, but how much they see is not it's just the area, it's not actual quantities. And this is the reason why I actually swapped this map to a proportional symbol, because when you look at it now, you kind of see, oh, actually those big circles are the cities, and actually the blue party had quite a number of votes. Um, right, so now let's, let me show you the, the whole rendering part, which is again, just as easy as uh, the one you saw before. Um, so for example, uh, for my CSV layer where I map the elections, the magic part that adds like the, the visuals to the data is this render over here, which um, is a, what we call a unique value render. This means, oh, my data is actually split in unique values and it matches the predominant party that I have in my field to, uh, oh, let me show you the code encoding here to uh, each party. And here I defined like my categories, like the mapping between the field, the number, uh, the name of the party, and uh, the, the color that I want to give to it. And these are the parties that were actually predominant. There were way more, but I didn't map them because none of them were predominant. So now we have that, but we, we don't need to stop there. Like um, there are various, what we call visual variables that you can you can use to, to, to map data. And what I also used, um, so visual variables are, for example, like color, opacity, um, size. And I, I used these three. I used the opacity to show percentage. So if a party is predominant, but is only with like only 40% uh, of the people, 
voted for it, then it's going to have a 0 0.3 opacity, which will make it show like less important. But then as we saw, for example, for the Hungarian party, they had 90 something percent in, in all the municipalities. So then I'm going to show it with opacity one. So everything bigger than 80% uh, has opacity one. And it works the same with the size visual variable. Um, I mapped it on the absolute value, so the number of votes. And then uh, for here, the way you read it is for 100 votes, the size of the circle will be 10 pixels. For 15,000, it will be 40 pixels and everything in between we interpolate. And basically that's all there is to it. Uh, there are other renderers and other types of visualizations, but uh, we're not gonna go into it today. We can talk about it afterwards. Um, yeah, this is, this is the map. And if you wanna find out more, you can like about all this visualization, you can check out our uh, website or just come and talk to me for lunch or so. <laughs> all right, that would be it. I am four minutes faster, that's incredible. <laughs> I talk very fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, that was it, thank you so much. <laughs>